All right. So we are continuing in Jews, Israel, and Jesus. And we're in unit two, which is to the Jew first. We've been talking about how the gospel, the good news, the good news of the kingdom of God, the good news of God sending his Messiah, the good news of God's salvation and deliverance for his people was proclaimed to the Jew first. First in order, first in priority. Salvation is to the Jews, it is for the Jews, it is from the Jews. But here we're going to flip it around a little bit and understand that the priority to the Jew first is also because they will face the wrath of God first. The wrath of God is coming. The day of judgment is coming, and it is coming first to the Jew. So the Jewish people need to hear with some priority that the good news has come, that Messiah has come, so that they don't become partakers of the bad news when the day of wrath comes. So we're going to look at some scriptures, particularly from the book of Romans, that makes this totally plain. So we'll pick up with Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. He will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. All right, so we know that was the messianic hope. That was the hope that was promised to Abraham, that was promised through the prophets, that was the mission of the Messiah who would bring eternal life. This is part of why Jesus had to be born Jewish under the law to merit eternal life. So he will give eternal life to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. All right, we're up to verse 8. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. So yes, God is love. Jesus came to show mercy. Jesus came to give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey him, there will be wrath and fury. We're up to verse 9. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. And remember that word Greek, it means Gentile, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek or also the Gentile, for God shows no partiality. All right, so that's pretty intense. That makes it clear. We've got to proclaim the gospel to the Jew first because the wrath of God, tribulation and distress, wrath and fury are coming to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So quickly, let me just give a quick background about the church in Rome or the Kehila that was in Rome, the gathering of believers that was in the city of Rome in that time. The Apostle Paul, when he was writing the letter to the Romans, he had actually never been to Rome. But this is later in his year, so he has an apostolic reputation. He knows many of the people who are in the church in Rome. Rome, and he's writing a letter to them with apostolic authority, and he's hoping to come and visit them soon. But part of the reason why he's writing this letter is because the Jewish people had been expelled from Rome for a few years under the emperor Claudius. He had expelled all Jews from the city of Rome. And according to what history says and what the scripture even says is that it was because there were rumors going around of revolts and riots happening because of someone called Christos. Well, the the Jewish people were not on Rome's really favored list because they were rebelling against Rome's authority. There was a lot of tumult and a lot of difficulty, and there were zealots who were trying to raise up riots against Roman rule and against Roman oppression among the people of Judea and the Jewish people who were in Diaspora, but in Roman territories of Diaspora. And so Rome was determined that they were not going to 
to tolerate Jewish revolts in any city. And this was absolutely not going to be tolerated in the city of Rome, which was the head of the government rule, where Caesar was. So Caesar, Claudius, he thought the best thing to do is let's just expel all of the Jews from Rome. He didn't really understand this whole story about Christos. And at that time, it was regarded that Christianity was just another uh, denomination, if you will, of Judaism. So the lines hadn't become really clear yet about these things. And so he expelled all of the Jews from the city of Rome. But that only stuck for a few years. And then the Jews were allowed to come back. And so the Jews returned to Rome. Now, this was all Jews, whether they believed in Jesus or not, all Jews were expelled from Rome. So when an expulsion is going on, they don't care what it is that's coming out of your mouth or what you say you believe. If you're a Jewish person by birth, then they're, you're counted as a Jewish person. And you can ask any Jewish person what I'm saying. They will be nodding their head in agreement about what I just said, because they encountered this same thing in the days of the Holocaust, which we're not talking about right now. But any type of expulsion, if you're Jewish, you're Jewish, no matter what else you might say. If you're Jewish, you're Jewish. So all Jews, believers in Messiah, believers that Jesus was the Messiah, and those who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, all Jews were expelled from Rome. But then they were allowed to come back. And so the Jewish believers in Jesus as the Messiah, they came back and they found the congregation. So a, a home church would have been probably like 40 people. So the different congregations that were there, the gathering of believers in the city of Rome, there were probably several of them at that time in different parts of the city, and they would gather together to worship Jesus, worship God, the God of Israel, together through Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, right? But what they found was that the Jewish people, before they had been expelled from Rome, the whole church was observing and participating in the Jewish feast or the feast of the Lord that you can find in the Old Testament. So the Passover, they would celebrate the Passover, but they wouldn't necessarily do it in a Jewish way. They would celebrate the Passover that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover. Jesus is the ultimate Passover lamb that brings exodus and freedom from slavery to sin and death. Jesus is the ultimate Passover lamb who shed his blood so that we put his blood on the doorposts of our hearts so that we are saved from the destroyer who is that ancient serpent, the devil. So celebrating the feast, it would be on the right day of Passover, but it would be done in a way that honors the work of Yeshua as the Messiah on behalf of the Jewish people. So it, the things like Easter and things like Christmas, they didn't come along until the 300s AD. That was not in the minds of any of these believers, and it wasn't in the minds of any believer in Jesus for 300 years from now. So in the context of the scriptures that we're about to talk about, Paul is writing to the church, the gathering of believers, because when the Jewish believers came back to Rome, they found that the Gentiles who had put their faith in Jesus as the Messiah of Israel, but also their Lord and Savior, the Gentiles were not continuing to practice the things that were from Jewish culture, like the feasts of the Lord and the festivals, or other common traditions that were part of Jewish culture culture. So because of this, disputes started to arise among the believers. Do they observe the Jewish customs? Do they not observe the Jewish customs? Are they required? Are they not required? And people started to argue. Jews and Gentiles, even those who called upon the name of Yeshua, who's supposed to bring peace between all people, and whose command was, love one another as I have loved you, they started arguing among themselves about what was right and what was wrong and what they were supposed to be doing. And so that's a large part of why the letter to the Romans was written and why Paul is trying to bring clarity to, yes, the differences between Jew and Gentile, but also uniting Jew and Gentile in Messiah, that there is no longer Jew and Gentile, but all are one in Messiah. Now I'm quoting a little bit from Ephesians, but anyway, you've got the point. So that's kind of the background of the letter to the church in Rome. Well, Romans chapter 1, 
Paul describes in detail how God has given the world over to a debased mind and depraved behavior. And it starts right after he talks about that the gospel is proclaimed first to the Jew and that the gospel is by faith for all who will believe and the righteous will live by faith. But it goes through a succession of how God continually turned people over to their own evil desire. People did not want to acknowledge God, so God turns them over to their own evil desire. People wanted to go into sexual immorality and all kinds of bodily depravity. God turns them over to their own evil desire. God turned people over to a debased mind, and their conduct gets worse and worse and worse the farther and farther they get away from the Most High God, the true God, the Creator God, the one who made them, and the one who made them in His image to be a reflection of his image. But the further they get away from him, the less and less they are representing his image in the earth. Well, we're not going to cover that whole passage of scripture, but we'll pick up at Romans chapter 1, starting with verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Okay, so that's the setup for where we're going to begin, which is in Romans chapter 2. Now, remember, when Paul is writing these letters, there are no chapters. This is one flow of thought from that thought closing right into what Paul continues to say. And he says, Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God falls rightly on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Okay, so tying all this together, the Jewish people, Jewish believers who had returned to the Church of Rome and have understanding of the law of God and have understanding that all of these types of behaviors that are listed are evil in the sight of God and deserve the wrath of God and that the judgment of God is coming upon those who practice such things, they are without excuse. Why? Because they are right. They have the righteous standard of God. They know what is right and wrong in God's sight. They know that the things that pagans, heathens, Gentiles do, that they are wrong, and that without the salvation of Jesus Christ, they are subject to the wrath of God and the punishment of God. They will face God's wrath for their wickedness. So the Jews, because they have the law of God, they are left without excuse. Why? Because they know what is wrong. They know what is wrong by God's standard, and they themselves will not escape judgment if they also continue to do wrong things. They are left without excuse. So you could also say that Jews are held to a higher standard to some extent because they have more access to the truth. So Paul goes on. We're going to jump down a few verses to Romans chapter 2, starting with verse 12. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. So that's Gentiles. Gentiles don't have the law. They don't have that speed limit sign on their road. So if they've sinned without the law, they will perish without the law. But he goes on, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So if you are a Jewish person and you have the law and you know what it says, then you are going to be judged by that law. So those who don't have a speed limit sign, they're not going to be judged by the speed limit sign. 
But if you have a speed limit sign, then you're guilty. If you know what the speed limit is, then you're going to be held to account of what that speed limit sign says. We're at verse 13. For it is not the hearers of God's law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. So you can go to synagogue every Saturday and hear the law, but that doesn't mean that you're obeying it. It's not hearers who are righteous before God, but those who do it. You have to do what it says. Well, Paul goes on to explain about the Gentiles. We're up to verse 14. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. So an example of this would be, you know, Gentiles, they teach their children not to lie. Now, do they have a law from the Most High God that lying is evil? Or that deceitful lips will not enter the kingdom of God? No, they don't. They just know from interactions with human beings that lying is wrong. They're a lie to themselves. They don't have the law, but by nature, they do what the law requires. They're a law to themselves. The scripture goes on. We're up to verse 15. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or excuse them. So their conscience says, ah, you know what? It's not right to tell a lie. There's something in humanity that knows right from wrong. You know when you're doing wrong, and you have a choice. When your conscience says, "Eh -eh, don't do that, you can either obey the warning of your conscience or you can violate it. So these are the conflicting thoughts. My conscience says no, but I really want to do it. Well, Jesus Christ is coming to judge the secrets of your heart. If your conscience has said, don't do that, that's not a right thing to do, and you have done it anyway, you will give account for that even though you are not under the law. That's what Paul is saying about Gentiles. And he goes on. So their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. So the Gentiles have the law of their own conscience, knowing what is right, knowing Knowing what is wrong, doing either what their conscience guides them into or violating their conscience to do wrong. God knows it all. He sees it all. Jews, on the other hand, might boast about having the law and being the chosen people and having the law of Moses, the laws of God, the ways of God revealed to them through the scripture. But They dishonor God through disobedience. So just like a Gentile can dishonor God by violating their conscience, a Jewish person can dishonor God by disobeying what the law says, even though they know what the law says, and they will be judged by the standard of the law. So the scripture continues, Romans 2, starting with verse 17. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God, and know his will, and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. So there it is. You know the law. You go to synagogue every Saturday. You study Torah. You understand what it says. You understand how to approve what is excellent and identify what is sinful. You rely on the law. You boast that you are the people of God. We're up to verse 19. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, and in instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. So you're boasting in the law and all the things that you know about the law. Verse 21, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? And remember, Jesus raised the standard of adultery to even looking at a woman lustfully, not just the act of adultery, but even looking lustfully at a woman. You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? 
You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And we'll talk about how the name of God was blasphemed among the Gentiles because of the Jewish people in a later unit. But we're seeing here that God, in his wisdom, which Paul exclaims about the wisdom of God, he is so enthusiastic about the wisdom of God, but God, by giving his son Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, he has brought Jew and Gentile both together. All have fallen short of the glory of God. There is not a Gentile on the planet who has not at one time violated their conscience and done something that their conscience told them was wrong. And there is not a Jewish person on the planet in the history of mankind who has not disobeyed the law in some form or fashion, except for, of course, Jesus. But he was born with the Holy Spirit. God is his father. He's the son of God. And that enabled him to live a sinless life. So the Jewish people are under sin. No one has been able to qualify according to the standard of the law. So you can know the law, you can talk about it all day long, but no one has been able to fulfill the law. Even if you preach it well to other people, you boast about the law, but you dishonor God when you break it. And for this, there will be tribulation, distress, wrath, and fury first to the Jewish people who are under the law. See, the law proves that the Jewish people have failed to attain righteousness before God. They have failed. They are just as sinful as Gentiles in the sight of God. Yes, they are chosen. Yes, they are beloved. Yes, they have the patriarchs. Yes, they have the law and the oracles of God. Yes, however, they haven't been able to meet the standard that God has set for them. And so they are just as sinful as Gentiles before God. And yet, at the same time that they are just as sinful as Gentiles, they are even more accountable for their sin because they knew the righteous requirement of God. So we'll look at Romans chapter 3, verse 19 through 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So again, through the law, we understand that no one except Jesus has ever been able to attain righteousness in the sight of God. If you are a Jewish person and you consider yourself to be under the law of Moses, you need the Messiah of Israel to save you from your sins because you cannot attain righteousness by trying to keep the law. It's not that the law isn't holy and perfect and righteous and good. It's that you are not perfect and holy and righteous and good. You are unable to meet the standard of the law. And because you are not able, you need the mercy of God. You need a Savior. And that Savior's name is Yeshua. His name is Jesus. And he came to die on a cross to shed his blood for the forgiveness of your your sins. What the law says, it says to those who are under the law, if you have not been able to attain righteousness by the standard of the law, which I guarantee you have not been able to, then there is wrath and fury and distress for the Jew first, because you have known what the law of God is. God shows no partiality. Everyone will be judged according to what they know and the standard to which they have been called. So Jesus talked about this. He was speaking a parable, but it makes it clear that the judgment of God, God is totally just. He is perfectly righteous. He will execute perfect justice on the day of judgment, not according to what people didn't know. God has mercy for ignorance. God has mercy for ignorance. But what you know you are responsible for. If you know, then you are responsible for putting into action what you know. If you didn't know, God knows that you didn't know. God knows the secret of your heart. But if you know the standard of God 
and you have not been living the knowledge that you know, then you will give account for that. This is from Luke chapter 12, verses 47 to 48. And that servant who knew his master's will, but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. So there it is. Now, Jesus here is talking about getting ready for the day of judgment. But what I'm saying, I'm drawing this in to make the point that the Jewish people have been given much. They have been given the patriarchs, the promises of scripture, the law of Moses, the promises of the prophets. They have been given much, but to whom much is given, much is also required. To whom much has been entrusted, and much has been entrusted to the Jewish people, but much will be demanded. God knows what you know. God knows what you don't know. If you know and you haven't done it, then you can expect the judgment of God to be severe. But if you haven't known, God knows what you didn't know. And even if you've done what deserves severe judgment, you might receive lighter judgment because God knows that you didn't know. But pulling all of this together, the point of this particular class is that we've got to proclaim the good news of Yeshua the Messiah to the Jewish people first because the wrath of God, wrath, fury, tribulation, and distress is coming to the Jewish people first. They need to hear the good news first because the wrath of God is coming to them first because they have been entrusted with so much. So I hope this unit has opened your eyes to understand that your Jewish neighbor or that Jewish person that's your co-worker don't think that they automatically get saved just because they're Jewish or that God has special favor for them just because they're Jewish. Yes, they are chosen. Yes, they are beloved. But they need to hear the good news of the Messiah who God has sent in fulfillment of all the promises that God made to their people people and to their patriarchs and through their prophets, they need to hear the good news first, and they need to hear it, friend, from you, because the wrath of God is coming, not only to the Gentile, not only to the whole world, but the wrath of God will come first to the Jew. So let us make it a priority to proclaim the good news of the gospel of God's salvation to the Jewish people first. (music) 